to add to this uh, question or any thoughts on it? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, the basic tensions are there between nation state and global citizenship, right? I think uh, probably more so in Canada than in Brazil from what I know, but uh, because uh, I mean, in, especially in terms of let's say knowledge flows or recognizing academic qualifications or professional qualifications, Canada is very restrictive, is it not? Uh, yes. Uh, which goes against the flow of what we, what we talk about uh, uh, globalization and knowledge flows and exchanges. Sure. So Canada is probably because of its specific situation in relation to south of the border, it has to be very defensive in certain aspects, in certain uh, uh, contexts as a nation state than Brazil does. Right? In Brazil we have a different, uh, perhaps a, a different uh, uh, situation. Our tensions are mainly in the large population spread over a large area and the extreme diversity internally. Right? So if we, uh, generally, especially in policy making, when we tend to think of Brazil, it's generally the urban white south. Right? We don't take into account the whole diversity. Right? Canada has a big space in the small population and the big brother south of the border. Right? Mm -hmm. So these things, I think, it's very easy in, uh, at the theory level to say we're, it's ridiculous to talk about the nation state anymore, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, but there are certain aspects, specific aspects, I think, contextual aspects of each, not each, but some nation states, especially Brazil and Canada, which are important to take into account. Um, so if we talk about the differences in English teaching, for example, even within Brazil, I mean, this is the, the national curriculum that Valkyria and myself have worked on within Brazil. Uh, for, for English language teaching. It's taking into account this diversity, so what do we do? It, it makes no sense for us to talk about policy. This is something we're going to be talking about tomorrow. But uh, uh, policy at a national level because of the extreme diversity that we have. And not just the diversity as we, we saw. Uh, it's very different to what we saw in Korea, for example. Uh, we have a diversity of teacher resources, uh, you know, teacher competence, teacher resources, and an extreme diversity of how the existence of English and how it's used. Mm -hmm. Just between uh, Rio and Sao Paulo, for example, mm -hmm. you know, you can, Rio, you can see, you can hear English on the street, and Sao Paulo, you can't. Mm -hmm. So this will make a difference to the kind of thing we, if you're an English teacher in Rio and Sao Paulo, English is not a distant object, or it is a distant object, depending on where you are. So we have that kind of diversity, which, which will be a tension when we are talking about English language teaching. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what, what that situation would be like in Canada. Is it the same for a uh, Francophone <laughs> Quebec uh, teacher in Montreal teaching English as a foreign language? Does that person have face the same kind of situation in Anglophone Canada? I'm, I don't know. No, but I think uh, uh, we hide these tensions <coughs> at the level of the nation. And when we talk about, when we just simply compare the nation state and globalization where the emphasis is on denationalizing the nation state. Uh, mm -hmm. I think these local specificities have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Neil? Yeah. It just occurs to me uh, that li listening, there is not one English either. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in Canada, uh, those people who think about the teaching of English in Canada, you, for example, I I'm sure that, that you have a notion of what it means to teach the Queen's English or Canadian English or English as an instrument or English as an ideology and so on and so on and so forth, i.e. Canada as an English-speaking nation, first of all, is not an English-speaking nation. It is bifurcated at least once and I would say many, many other times. And secondly, Canada has its own relation, its own political, historical, ideological relation to English, which is quite different from the American relation to English, mm -hmm. the Australian, the New Zealand, and so on and so forth. So there is not one English, although we tend to think of English as this hegemonic force, it, which it is. Uh, it, each nation in itself, uh, I, would, I would go further than that, but, but each nation also has its own conception of that language, English, which it, it's teaching. It, it itself is a fractured, multiple kind of concept. That's a good point, and it would have complex interactions or integrations with language and content like citizenship. That's a good point. Let's, uh, let's go to the uh, examples now. So yeah. Okay.
if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, the first example that that I uh, showed was um, an activity that one participant in my PhD research devised. But now I'm going to present some activities that I devised for my undergraduate students right after I returned from my PhD leave, as I said. Um, this is interesting because yesterday uh, Brian was just mentioning that his students have been wondering how to implement critical literacy in the language teaching classroom. So this, this was my, my first try out. Uh, I've taught this course twice, in fact. So this wa I divided the course in four projects, four different projects. This was the first project. And of course, this is a language course, an English course at the undergraduate level for uh, students preparing to become English teachers. So uh, the first project was about stereotypes. So I first used this, uh, these images and asked them to try to think about which countries these images represent or which countries they think the images represent. Um, and the, the linguistic focus was time, tense, and aspect, or the English verb system, because that was the, the content of the course. When I got the course, somebody gave me, oh, this is the content that you have to teach. I looked at it, oh, time, tense, and aspect, okay. But I want critical literacy, so I had to teach time, tense, and aspect through critical literacy. So this is how I came out with the, uh, so can you show the next one, please? Right. Okay, so uh, these were some questions to help them discuss the, the images. Can you go on to the next one, please? So I used two different texts about um, Carnival in Brazil because uh, this was the beginning of the first semester. So it was right after ca Carnival. Um, so this first text is, uh, was written by uh, an, a native, Amer Amer sorry, a native in English speaker, an American, if I'm not mistaken, who had lived in Brazil for five years in Salvador. So he, he wrote a, a long text about what is carnival in Salvador, how it looks like, what kind of parties people go to, what kind of costumes they use, if they use costumes, and how uh, carnival in Salvador differs from carnival in Rio and Sao Paulo, for example. So, in fact, the, the, the text was full of stereotypes. I'm not saying that uh, the things that he wrote about are wrong, they are not. In, in many ways they are correct. They are true facts about Carnival in Brazil. But I, I wanted students to perceive that those uh, things that he was talking about did not apply for every single person in Salvador or in Rio or so. so they in fact are stereotypes, right? Uh, the next one, please. Uh, so this one was another text uh, written about the fire that we had in, that was at the end of 2010 in Rio that damaged many of the, um, the floats and costumes of the, the Samba schools. Um, so this is a more factual text it's about something that had just happened. Uh, so in terms of language issues, I from this text, I, I focused on the past tense. The other one had more present perfect and um, simple present um, examples of the, the English verb system. But still, I was trying to, to focus on the stereo stereotypes that were uh, represented in the text. Can you show the next one? This was the second project. Um, so here I was, I had to teach if clauses and I happened to hear this song on the radio and I, I, this is perfect for my if clause te, uh, class on, on, with critical literacy. So I, I tried to, to approach the idea of gender differences and how uh, different genders, especially in Brazil, get different salaries for the same job, for example, and how things have changed, how women have, uh, have come to go into the, the work market, things like that. And I used this song and worked with uh, if clauses. 
I guess that's all for what I had to present. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you. So. Well, uh, before I show you my examples, I'd like to say that um, these examples I'm going to show were written by my students. I mean, uh, I have these students who are, who are in their internship period, so uh, they have to go to school and they have to prepare some lessons, some classes to teach at school. So what I have to do is to help them prepare these classes. So what I did was a proposal. I I I had I came out with this I came out with this idea of putting together uh, language as the teacher the school teacher wanted my students to do so she wanted them to to go to school to teach uh, simple present or present perfect whatever and I wanted them to to work with a theme a topic and they should go to school and observe some classes and decide which topic they thought would be suitable for that for those students okay so. You are going to see here the examples of uh, the, the activities my students prepared and some of their reflections on the activities on, on and on uh, the students' reactions to the activities they, they presented. Okay, so that's just to, to give you some information, please, Brian. So uh, this is uh, one of my students before I show the activities. She said, well, we intend with this theme, the battle of sexes, the social role of genders, to allow students to reflect, as the students don't question that much, about the social roles of men and women. We will, we will use ads as genre because they are usually part of students' lives. So they decide to work with uh, an ad and to create some activities. So uh, there is also this belief that if, if we work with uh, something that is critical or something that is a theme, it's, it's impossible to work with language. So how can I work with language development or language learning? Uh, and so students tried to uh, create some activities which were uh, language basic, kind of, uh, you know, you don't need to know that much English to do this kind of activities. So it was just, you know, uh, to say yes or no, if they agreed or not, and uh, to relate to the uh, uh, professions to men or women, that's all. Okay, and then we have uh, another student saying something. She said we use a, a handout in which they should associate certain phrases and professions to the image of men and women. Uh, thus, we could collect each student's belief about gender roles and make them reflect about it, questioning how those beliefs have, be have been built and taken as truth. So they were trying to understand how students have these ideas. And of course, my students and me. Uh, that was a challenge for everybody. And then, uh, yeah, these are some of the ads they use. They use some old ads and some modern ads. So here we have though these ads like, the chief does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. You know, and uh, ads like those, <laughs> things like that just to, Okay, just to show what they used. Then we had some reading comprehension activities, very simple. Okay, it's for women, which of those products is for women, things like that, just to show you. Then some modern ads they use it just to show uh, the role of women in ads and how men are shown and how women appear in ads. They, they did lots of activities on the grammar activities, comprehension, things like that. And then? We had, ah, uh, yeah. And then they happened to <coughs> use also a song, which is this Bob Girl. I don't know if you are familiar with this song. It's very, I'm a Bob Girl in a Bob Girl world. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very basic. They are trying to, to, they were trying to teach simple present tense. No, Barb love or love scan. So the students just, just had to choose the correct language pattern. Okay. And then, uh, these are some results because, again, I am very concerned about those uh, low social um, value that teachers have in Brazil. So uh, my students, after this experience or during the experience, they came up, came out with some reflections on the work they were doing. So one of them said, oh, during our lessons, we had some problems related to students' behavior, which made me feel very demotivated. That's a, a problem we have people don't want to become teachers, so. Uh, I think it's very important to be respected by the students. I learned we teachers need to find ways to be more respected. So that's, she thinks that's re her responsibility too. The other one says uh, that students are not <coughs> very uh, 
they don't care much about English, but she says, uh, I believe it's not only students' responsibility. Many times, uh, we teachers get used to the situation and don't do anything to change. In this case, she's referring to the fact that many teachers just go to school and teach grammar all the time, and that's all. They don't really try to do something different. And uh, the other student says that it's interesting that not only the students could reflect on the theme, but we, we also had this opportunity because of what students said. It was not enough for students to read the texts. It was also necessary to develop some critical awareness so that it was possible to understand other meanings hidden in the discourse. This student was influenced by Matos and Valerio texts because <laughs> I gave them something to read. So they were you know, very excited about the ideas presented. And that's what I, I, I had to show you. Is it okay if I'm standing? He, here is okay? Uh, to the right yeah. of the screen. The bottom one is forward. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I'm, I'll try to be brief here. So I just have a quotation, Diana's quotation. So she says, those of us teaching English in different contexts around the world need to experiment and document how we are meeting needs and inspiring the agency of our students in this context. So I won't read, uh, well, we need to begin much more concentrated and continue sharing of our struggles, discomforts and rewards as we develop critical literacies appropriate to the ways in which our local environments are increasingly cross-cultural and questioning of the advice that comes, up, comes to us from <coughs> the established centers of the world. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to share so what we've been doing li linking critical literacy and teaching english so i'll try to be brief here so i am um, i teach at federal university of alagoas and the project i'm focusing here on is the an extension project i'm the coordinator it's named casas de cultura no campus so um there are 18 teachers and they are my undergraduate students majoring in english and they teach other undergraduates from the federal universities and these students are selected by a, a social agent because they have to be in financial and social vulnerability so two classes of 100 minutes mondays and wednesdays they teach english and on tuesdays and thursdays they have meetings with me so what, what's the aim so of course to encourage them to to be or uh, uh, teachers because they are studying to become teachers and of course to encourage them to reflect upon their development process as a teacher so as to make their students more aware more critical so the f the focus here on my presentation is the dialogue between theory and practice that's what i mentioned earlier that was a challenge so critical literacy so try to make lesson plans using critical literacy to teach english so uh, during these meetings and if they need some extra uh, meetings uh, in the mornings in the afternoons conversation about their lesson plans their difficulties I also give them feedback on their journals because they have to write journals every single class so that they can reflect upon their uh, teachings so uh, specifically I'll take just one um, student she's Rafaela so she was teaching basic one so the process was so she elaborated her lesson plan and the top she selected so she was they are, they were free so each of the 18 students so teachers they were free to select a topic so basically the 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 the, the, the instruction was select the first topic and then we decided what grammar topic we will be discussing because then they could uh, understand the social function of, uh, of a text. And then she selected for her group, gay beauty pageant, pageant. So we discussed the plan, we reviewed some of the procedures, so I'm not here getting into details of what kind of procedures, the listening steps, the reading steps. Well, when the plan was ready, so she carried out in five classes. So the first two classes, reading and video about gay beauty pageant in South Africa in 2012. And then they read the text, Mr. Gay Raises the Storm in Africa. And on this site, there were some comments by, made by South Africans, criticizing the event. And then um, bringing, 
what was happening in South Africa to Maceió, which is the capital of Alagoas. So, and then she discussed with the students. So what would your position be if that event were about to happen in Maceió? And then the students made some comments. And then these are the comments. So her emphasis was on basic one was uh, on writing also. So despite so this is exactly what they wrote in English, basic one students. I agree with the, this event because it will disclose Montreal and will produce income for the city. On the other hand, the Brazil should recognize the normal nature of homosexuality. The children must learn to respect others and grow up free to choose which way to go. No oppression. The event gives our country the opportunity to be like totally free, equal, and involved. The second one, I'm against any kind of prejudice. All should, should respect the differences. Each one has the right to make their choices. And the last one, I not like who this event happened in Brazil. I have my principles, my religion, my base, so I'm not in favor of the Mr. Gay here. The Mr. Gay was a big fight in Africa that people not accept. I think who in Brazil would be similar, despite the Brazilian <coughs> be very liberal. I believe with this event not would be good for the families. We have a model of family, as the Bible says. One man and one woman shall form one family. The Mr. Gay discloses the movement gay, and this isn't for the good for, the, for whose no agree with that style of the life. So after these first two classes, we discussed, and she was not happy with the class because she couldn't make the students see other points, being critical in the sense that as, uh, uh, as I defined in question number one. So then, uh, not happy, not achieved, and then uh, she prepared another uh, lesson plan, right? And here I just quote some of the uh, uh, Volkidis, right? To be critical means to expand one's perspective, right? <coughs> so we thought of continuing the discussion. So what happened? Local newspaper article, that article was in Portuguese. It's a murder of a homosexual couple in Alagoas. And then she worked with this reading. And another plan, reading article, role play, and written production. So the written production was, um, if they think of an event happening in Maceió, so what kind of event would that be? So this is one production the students <coughs> wrote it out. First Congress against the prejudice gay between 1st and 3rd of May 2012. Round tables, homophobia. The speeches, Elton John, start and finish, the time of the, the, the speech, workshops, cases of prejudice in Maceió and law that protects the gays in the world. The place of the event, center of a convention in Maceió, finishes, so Elton John speeches, etc. And this was one of the written productions for basic one students. And then one particular comment from a student is to, just this week now that I was preparing the, 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 the slide, struck me, and I, I thought at that time when <coughs> I was preparing, I didn't pay that much attention as I paid yesterday when I was reviewing the slides. So this one could finish it up, I guess, the presentation and what I think the next step should be towards, so in my context, should be the next step dealing with critical literacy and teaching English. Particularly, I could learn, this is from a student, Rafael is a student. Particularly, I could learn that the lack of arguments or the extremist presentation of an opinion doesn't comply with the role of convincing the others. In fact, it, it only helps to maintain the prejudice built along history. And, the, and therefore, it will only be deconstructed within a long-term period. Deconstructing prejudice is like throwing a seed of prudence in the soil and cultivate it without haste so that we can see it big, full of leaves, fruit, and flowers. Within a short period of time, however, intolerance should be intolerated. So that's why um, the, the idea was that because of, of this, I think we should work on, right? So being critical means being able to see, not only to see, but to understand the different possible 
and acceptable perspectives. In fact, being able to listen to the other and then take actions. And then, so as a challenge, English plus critical literacy can happen not only with polemical issues. So I don't, I don't want you to take the, 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 the idea that just because she worked with gay, so sexual orientation, that critical literacy means polemical taxes. can be with any other kind of taxes. And then a challenge is the use of L1 in the classroom. Is that possible? Is again, so depending on the class with the students we have, so some feel comfortable using the first language so they, they can argue and take a stand. I think this is important. There is another student. She was teaching <coughs> pre-intermediate two, which is the fourth semester, and she did the same thing, so she selected a, a topic and they could discuss, argue in English. So that was possible because they had the level of English mixing English and Portuguese. And so what I've been trying to do with them, so they are undergraduate students, no matter what policies, whether you will be teaching English at a private institution or a public, right? I think we should focus on as teacher educators that our future teachers should become active citizens and we should, in a way, promote agency. I guess that's it. Thank you. Yours? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, an example of uh, attempted practice. Uh, last year, I presented at a Tesla Ontario conference, which is uh, our provincial organization for ESL teachers. And in this presentation, I went in there to talk about critical pedagogy, and I had all these examples that I wanted our, uh, the participants to engage in, and these participants are all probably teachers. It's a conference for teachers, so I'm assuming most of them are teachers in LINK or ESL or in school boards. And when I went in there with all these, so some of the examples were um, how would you address Halloween in the classroom? Halloween is a holiday we have in Canada. And uh, how would you address same-sex marriage in the classroom and stuff like that? And uh, I didn't get a sense of the teachers wanting to engage in, in, in similar to what you were talking about, but it was more like, well, we just got to tell them this is the way it is. And, <laughs> and um, you know, that they have to refer to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms about equality and, and, and whatnot. And I just, I didn't really get a sense that uh, they understood as how I understood critical pedagogy to be. And I think that's because in our teacher training programs, it's, it's not, um, it, it's an add-on or it's like a chapter at the end of a, of a teacher training book. And it's not really, got a lot of substance in our um, education of teachers. And I was going to talk, but for in light of the time, I'm just going to make one more comment, is uh, Penny Cook and Kanagaraja talks about critical pedagogy being an attitude and, and it should be a way of doing, not just a theory. And we have these wonderful examples about, of uh, critical pedagogy, but when does that start? Like, what's CLB level? Because I teach a level one, and there's no concrete uh, examples of teaching that with low-level students. And you don't have the language to engage with students about it. So I think that there's a little bit of a gap in our field about how do we do this with very low-level students who have a hard time expressing themselves in the language. Okay, good. So. Is it five o'clock that we? Five o'clock there. Okay, so I'm going to be very quick. <laughs> um, my example, it's it's dated, but it came up quickly. It came up when we were reading Andrea's Andrea's article uh, chapter, and some of my students said, "How can the Nokia uh, letters be critical?" I mean, that seemed like very functional, basic teaching. And then Andrea gives a a very persuasive. Uh, discussion of the context that made it happen, and the histories and identities. 
Um, this, uh, what Christine's talking about, this was a critical moment, and it goes back a long time. It's where, um, on the surface, grammar translation in bilingual dictionaries is not considered higher order critical work. In fact, they say, oh, that's, that's just, you know, you're usually told not to do that. But it happened at this time where one of my students in class just said, is Canada going to break up? And they had read a Chinese, like a lower level class, they had read a Chinese translation of the um, referendum question from Quebec. And then the whole activity, these were, now identity was a factor. These were students leaving Hong Kong because of the British, uh, re pay, uh, what's the exact term, the um, reacquisition, the colonial, the neo-colonial reacquisition. And uh, so you had interesting issues around what did the referendum mean? And the whole activity became one where the students, given the context where they strongly, for them, learning to be literate means learning to memorize and learning words. Words was foundational. To be literate, 5,000 words is basic. Learning a formal style of writing where each, each stroke must follow an order. So words were key in this class. Anytime they saw a word, they wouldn't inference, they wouldn't, they first, I've got to know, I have to know what it means. And so this became the activity of comparing and debating dictionary translations on the board about the two words. The word sovereignty, what? The word sovereignty and the word independence. And the, and the debates were so interesting. In Chinese and English, we were talking about translanguaging, movement between languages, and the whole exercise, the outcome was, if we don't understand the, sov the, uh, the referendum question, it's not because we're second language learners and we don't know the language that, that the people have constructed the question. And then this kind of coming at it through, lit through certain kinds of uh, literacy habits uh, of, of ways of approaching it. So all of these things came out of the debates about what, what are they talking about? Are they talking about more sovereignty? Is it independence? They wrote these characters on the board. They wrote others. They debated it. And this became what I would say, it, it, on the surface, to say you did grammar translation in bilingual dictionaries, and you said that was critical. I go, what? But here, in this context with these people, and in this moment, I thought it was a critical, or it had critical possibilities. And that's it. I think we have time for one or two questions. Okay. <laughs>